For most of the year, the buildings of Sorrento echo to youthful voices. However, the names of those buildings echo to the sound of long tradition. The main lodge, for instance, is called Spesbona, Good Hope. The main center of residence and hospitality, Richardson Lodge, has long been called Nova Vita, New Life. And a nearby center of teaching is called Caritas, Charity or Love. This lawn is seldom empty and quiet as it is here. Children play here, adults gather. Beyond where the cross hangs is the chapel on the edge of a hillside. Beyond the chapel is the lake, Shushwap, a thousand kilometers of beautiful coastline. And beyond the lake, the mountains roll away northeast as the Monashi Range. Sorrento never allows you to take it for granted. The lawn fills with activity, the chapel with song, the lake can change within minutes from stillness to storm. The mountains change color by the hour. Everything here is alive. I speak to you today from a chapel in Christchurch Cathedral, Victoria. As well as being a cathedral, this is also, of course, a parish church, a congregation. I say that because something is happening to congregational life all across Canada. We use groping words to describe how we see ourselves these days, and we, we use words such as prayer book, evangelical, Anglo-Catholic, traditional, progressive, liberal, conservative, and so on. But however we try to describe ourselves, there is something even much more significant happening to us all. We are being changed. Note how I say that. We are being changed. How? We're being changed from traditional Anglican parishes to 21st century Anglican spiritual centers. And what do I mean by that? A generation ago, an Anglican parish could be defined as a congregation, but today, that same parish is very different. Today, a parish is much more a gathering of individuals, each of whom sees him or herself to be on a personal, spiritual journey. And this new reality is affecting the way we worship, the way we see ourselves, the way we preach, the way we do Bible study, the way we relate to the culture around us, the way we design our parish programs. These winds of change have been blowing all through history, of course. In the middle of the last century, however, they brought us the cultural revolution we call the 60s. And so it was that in 1962, the Canadian Church took a bold step. It brought into being a place and a program. In that place, people could gather to grapple with this whirlwind of change. That place and that program was and is Sorrento Center. At that time, all we could do was to form hunches about what God was calling us to. Fifty years later, of course, we are still having to hunch what God is calling us to and how we respond. But here are some realities which we began to discern back then. One, we began to see that because everything around us was obviously in a whirlwind of change, that faithfulness to Jesus Christ was going to mean thinking and living in response to that change. Two, we began to see that if our understanding of Christian faith was going to be 
different, then the way we do church would have to be different. Three, we began to see that the Holy Spirit was offering us four magnificent images by which to grasp Christian faith. A lifelong journey to be lived and in which to grow in Christ. A powerful story to be told and shared with the culture around us. A deep mystery to be experienced in the heart and to be explored in the mind. A magnificent song, a song to be sung not only with our voices, but by our lives, personal and professional, lived out in the world of our time. Down through the years, these are the images by which Sorrento has offered Christian faith, and it has helped literally thousands of people to respond to a changing world and a changing church. And, and by the way, this is very important, to do that without fear or despair. Why is that important? Because you see, among the many ways in which we respond to great change can be fear or perhaps even anger or despair. Sorrento has always challenged those three things, fear, anger, and despair, and instead it offers hope and life and love. Remember, after all, the names of those buildings, Spes Bona, Good Hope, Nova Vita, New Life, Caritas, Love. There is one great difference between that long ago year, 1962, and today. That church of a generation ago had not yet had to face the consequences of the vast challenges still ahead of it. Today's church, as we well know, wrestles with an utterly changed culture. Now, I think it very important that we realize that the church is not alone in this struggle. It's easy to forget that the same is true of political parties, great corporations, healthcare delivery systems, educational institutions, Even the traditions of the world of law wrestle these days with societal and cultural change. In all this, one of the really valuable gifts a Christian possesses is that we share a very long story. When we check out that story, we see some very interesting patterns. I want to bring one of those patterns and bring it into focus. Let's go on a time journey. A little more than 2,000 years ago, about the same time as a small boy was growing up in the hill village of Nazareth, a group of Jewish people looked at the society around them in that city, and they did not like what they saw. They saw corruption, they saw a decline in public morals, and they decided to leave the city and to go down to the shores of the Dead Sea. And down there they formed what they thought of as a center of intentional Jewish spirituality. Here they would seek the will of God for themselves and for future generations. We call these people Essenes, and we call that place Qumran. In the fourth century AD, when the Western Roman Empire was buckling, thoughtful Christians saw that the future of the faith and the church would have to be different. One of them was Martin of Tours. He was a senior officer in the Imperial Guard who resigned to take holy orders and was eventually consecrated bishop. Martin founded a community near the city of Tours, a center of intentional Christian spirituality. 
put it in the beautiful spot in the Loire Valley, and it would become the template for a new way of doing church. And that new way would spread and take hold, and it would form a bridge to the future. It would become what we today call Celtic Christianity. We call that place Montmartre. In 563 AD, a group of young men would risk themselves to the most dangerous tidal race in the North Atlantic. Sailing and rowing from Ireland to Scotland, they would eventually beach their pathetically small boat at the south end of a tiny three-mile-long island. Today, after 1,500 years, that island is still a center of 21st century intentional Christian spirituality. We call that place Iona. In the early decades of the 20th century, a Presbyterian minister named George MacLeod would bring to Iona young people from the depression-ridden slums of Glasgow. And together they would rebuild the ruined abbey on Iona and in it they would form a center of intentional Christian spirituality. In the last decade of the sixth century, when the dissolution of the Western Roman Empire was complete, and when Rome itself had gone from being a city of nearly a million people to one of less than 50,000, the genius of two young men, the monk Benedict and the bishop Gregory, brought into being a new kind of center of intentional Christian spirituality. They called them monasteries. And these centers would help to birth the Middle Ages. The first would be on a hilltop south of Rome, and we call that place Monte Cassino. In 1944, a young Protestant pastor named Roger Schultz came to a small town about 250 miles southeast of Paris. Schultz could clearly see the weakness of the post-war institutional churches. So he and his sister bought a house in which a small community formed. Roger Schultz's vision was of a center of intentional Christian spirituality. From that center, the work would become worldwide, especially among youth. We call that place Teze. In 1962, the Anglican Diocese of Western Canada looked at a green field with a few scattered buildings. It lay between the Trans-Canada Highway and a vast lake and they not only looked, but they acted. They brought into being a center of intentional Christian spirituality. We call that place Sorrento Center. Qumran, Montmartre, Iona, Monte Cassino, Teze, Sorrento Center. Every one of them centers of intentional Christian spirituality, all of them being formed in times of change and challenge, and all of them nourishing a struggling institutional church. For 50 years, Sorrento has offered itself to the church as a doorway into the future, the future of Christian faith. And I've tried to point to what I think is a very significant pattern in our long Christian story. Again and again, when the institutional church was struggling in the face of massive change, God guided us into forming centers of intentional Christian spirituality. If this is true, I offer you this thought. 
because today's church is struggling in the face of immense change of every conceivable kind. It is even more essential than ever to keep open a doorway to the future, a doorway through which we and our children and our grandchildren can go to seek the forms of tomorrow's church and tomorrow's faith. From its first day, Sorrento has been and is such a doorway to the future. In the late summer of the year 563, Columba and his band of young monks landed on the shingle beach that is at the south end of Iona. They were probably drenched and exhausted. Columba left the boat and began to walk towards a nearby hill. A young monk called out to him, But father, the island is so small. And Columba turned and said very gently, My son, it is small, but it will be great. I commend Sorrento to your prayers, to your most serious thinking, and to your generosity. Thank you.